Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege and a joy uh, to be able to speak to you uh, for these few minutes uh, this morning. Thank you, Pastor Wayne and Anne and Michael and Vanessa for your gracious invitation. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm a Japanese-American Israeli, uh, Japanese face, American-sounding voice, Israeli passport. <laughs> My wife and I came here 30, almost 32 years ago as immigrants, and we spent the entire time on Mount Carmel uh, with another great couple in ministry. The four of us founded a Messianic congregation reaching out to Jews and Arabs on the top of Mount Carmel. We've been uh, leading it ever since, although now we're in a leadership transition. A new generation of younger Israeli leaders are rising up um, and um, beginning to take over parts of our ministry. What we started as a handful of believers, Jews and Arabs, uh, working and serving and worshiping together has now turned into a network of ministries that reach out to our city. Uh, and uh, and we, we dream beyond that uh, of reaching out yet to our nation. Um, it's been a, a tremendous adventure. It's been filled with a lot of challenges. There's a lot I'd like to share with you. Um, time will not permit. I've got a couple books that are available out where the merchandise is sold. So if you're interested in getting more teaching about how Israel is important to Christians and how it relates to the Great Commission, uh, believers in the marketplace, you can uh, check out those resources. The most important thing that you can receive while you're here in Israel is revelation. You know, you need uh, to ask God to open the eyes of your hearts. There's something, um, something about the spirit of truth that cuts through the politics, it cuts through the old stones and the history, and can impart to you a sense of mystery, a sense of awe, that God has chosen our generation to be the first in 2,000 years, the first generation of Christians in 2,000 years, to come to this land, the homeland of the people of Israel, to be able to come into a place where Yeshua is being worshiped as a Jewish Messiah, among his own people, in his own land, in his own language for the first time in 2,000 years. Most of the congregations, uh, Messianic congregations, that are uh, beginning to spread across this land are still being run by their founders. Because when we came 30-some years ago, we caught a wave of God's purposes, uh, his plans that had been hidden from the eyes of man, that had been hidden from the eyes of the church for two millennia. And then we come along, and coming to bring the gospel back to the people of Israel, we learn that, um, that God wants to restore his kingdom here. Now, in choosing um, what to say to you and what to focus on in these minutes this morning, the difficulty was what not to say, because there's, there's so much that can be said. But um, I thought I would focus on the why, um, why we're all here. Why, why do we uh, plant and, and build uh, congregations? Why do we disciple Israeli believers, Jews and Arabs and people from other nations? Why do we reach out to the poor? Why, why are we concerned about children? Why, why do we look at the marketplace? Why do we want to uh, develop a new generation of Israelis? Uh, how do we believe that this is going to all contribute to all Israel shall be saved? So in, in focusing on the why, I really was led to this important concept, and my prayer in these minutes is that you'll catch something from these words. You know, when the, when the Spirit speaks to the church, those truths are, are better caught than taught. Something, something about that Spirit will, can, can drop a seed uh, in your heart that in time can be nurtured, put down roots, grow up, and bear fruit in your life. So I'd like to talk to you about Israel and the kingdom of God. And what Israel brings to the party, so to speak, when it comes to understanding what is the kingdom of God. Now, most of you know that the kingdom of God was Jesus' primary message when he walked this earth. He began his ministry with a proclamation, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He taught his disciples, and through them he taught us to pray. He said, pray in this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At one point, he emphasized this so strongly to his disciples, basically he was telling them, this is the most important thing I can teach you. He said to them, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you need will be given to you. 
When Jesus taught the multitudes, it was his practice to use small stories called parables. So many of his parables, and it's amazing that you, on the, those of you who went on the tour, you walked in the footsteps of Yeshua, and you stood at the site of where some of those parables were actually spoken. So many of his parables begin with the same words. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is like a merchant who went seeking fine pearls. The kingdom of God is like a fisherman who threw his net into the sea. The kingdom of God is like a, a, a farmer who, who sowed seed in the soil. The kingdom of God is like a woman who put yeast in a lump of dough. The kingdom of God is like a man who found treasure buried in the ground. The kingdom of God over and over and over again. This is so, uh, so obvious for those who are students of the Bible that most of us come away with the impression that the kingdom of God begins with Jesus and virtually everything we need to know about the kingdom of God is to be found in the New Testament. Now that's how I was taught. That's what I taught for many years. But now I've come to believe that that vision of the kingdom of God that starts with Jesus, after all, he's the king of the kingdom, and he's preaching that it's here now. Why wouldn't we believe that everything that follows is about building his kingdom on earth? Well, I've come to believe that now that's like coming into a long movie after the intermission. You know, if you come into a movie in the middle, if you pay attention, eventually you'll find out how it ends. And uh, if you're alert enough, you'll figure out who the main characters are, but you'll never understand why it ends the way it ends, nor will you have an insight into the motivations and the real character of the people in the movie. So it is with the kingdom of God. It does not start in Matthew chapter 4 with Jesus' proclamation. It starts much earlier. It starts, I would say, back in the book of Exodus, and it starts with a people and a nation called Israel. This is very, very important understanding, um, particularly when it comes to understanding what God means by every tribe. Um, you know, when, 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 we, when we look at Israel as God's chosen example for the world, and that, and that really is, is what it's about. I mean, when I first came to the Lord, you know, I, I'm, I was acutely aware that my people, where my ancestry is from, my people, um, ethnically speaking at least, my people, Japan, were not mentioned once in the Bible. I mean, I looked. <laughs> you know, I searched, okay? Not once, page after page after page. And, and um, well, actually, I'm still kind of angry about that. <laughs> but it seems like every, every time I, I bring that subject up to God, I seem to get kind of the same answer from him. And the answer is something like, Oh, well, Peter, uh, you're just going to have to get over it. I, I chose one people, one nation to be the example for all. And all of us kind of have to look and to, and to learn. Uh, one way to understand this is um, when I was born, my sister was already four years older than me. And there was just two of us, uh, two of us kids in the family, me and my older sister. Now, decades later, she's still four years older than me. I tried everything, but, but I never quite caught up. However, there were uh, some things, a few things, that, uh, that I did learn as a little brother never to do because I watched her interaction with our parents. I, I think it was just uh, natural. I mean, she was four years older. We'd get into trouble, and our parents would say to her, you should have known better. And a lot of times, me, they just kind of ignore, okay? They might be severe with her, but they'd expected me most of the time to watch and to learn. And at least some of the time, some of the time, I learned some things never to do. So it is with Israel. In God's family of the nations, among every nation, every tribe, and every tongue, okay? All created by God. All beloved by God with a desperate, redeeming Love, every people, every tribe, every tongue. But in God's family of the nations, there is one firstborn nation, and that is the nation of Israel. And this nation, God created. Okay, He didn't recycle an existing nation. God created Israel from one man. He chose this man, Abraham. He called him. He made a covenant with Abraham and said, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. And from you and from your family, all the nations of the world will be blessed. 
And he's been working that plan since the days of Abraham right up until our day. He, he caused Abraham to pass that promise and that covenant down from generation to generation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel has 12 sons who became the heads of the tribes of Israel. Because of one of those sons, Joseph, they all went into, uh, into slavery in Egypt. Uh, you, know, you know the story about Joseph's betrayal and how the, because of that, the whole family ended up in Egypt. He saves his family. It's actually a, a prophetic picture of the Messiah. But they're in Egypt for 400 years. After they come out of Egypt, we know that there are about 3 million people. They're free in the desert, and God appears to them again. I want to quote to you what God says to them in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God appears to this Three million man mass, disorganized mass of people, dysfunctional in terms of nationhood. They've been slaves for 400 years. All they know is slavery. They've lived beside the Nile River, one of the greatest rivers in the world, for four centuries. Now they're in the hottest and driest place in the world, in the Sinai Desert. They're free, but they're free to do what? <laughs> okay, they're not going to survive. God appears to them and speaks to them, and he says, you will be to me. You will be to me a kingdom, a priestly kingdom, and a holy nation. Now, what does it mean when God says, you will be to me a kingdom? It means, today, I become king. And Israel accepted that offer. <laughs> Moses was never king, right? Always the servant of the Lord, the prophet of the Lord. God became king in the desert of Israel. Therefore, Israel became the kingdom of Israel. God. Ta -da! Okay, the music should play, the credits should roll, okay, the, the light should come on, and the, the title of the movie comes on the screen, The Kingdom of God. Here's where it starts. It starts in the desert. It starts with a people. It starts with a national plan. All right, this is vitally important for the church today. We understand God has an individual plan. We know about individual salvation. We know what it is. I've decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Okay? If I'm the only person in the world, I will still honor him as my king. We know he's got an individual plan. And his plan for me and for you is to be conformed in the image of his son. We've learned that he has a family plan. I mean, we've been talking about families, and we understand that God creates families. And he has a plan for every family. But... Families become families of families. We call those people tribes, okay? God has a tribal plan, and this is really important. A lot of people don't realize that. We think tribalism or ethnicity is some mistake, okay, some problem, because all we see is the negative aspects of it. But God has a tribal plan. He creates tribes. He's behind tribes. And when the tribe decides on a course of direction or a, a tribe decides on certain beliefs, certain values, when a tribe says, Jesus is Lord of us. Listen, it's very hard to change. Very hard to change. There's power in the tribe. Okay, so God has a tribal plan. All right, but now listen. When the tribes agree that they will serve together under one king, when the tribes agree, okay, when the ethnicity, when the, when the ethnic groups, the, the, the families of families, when they come together and agree, because of this king, because we trust him, because of his love, because of his justice, because of his righteousness, we agree we will serve together with the other tribes, then you have a nation, okay? God creates nations. And the picture of God's plan for the nation that he chose to be the priestly nation, which means the example nation, the model nation for all the nations of the world, because he's working that plan from the days of Abraham. He said, in you and in your people, and I will make of your people a great nation. You will be the head and not the tail. And you and your people will be a blessing to all the people, all the nations of the world. 
So now we have Israel emerges, biblical Israel emerges as God's national plan, the nation where God leads his king, and because of his righteousness, because of his love, because of the goodness of the kingdom of God, the tribes agree to serve together. Okay, so that, God led them through the wilderness. Okay, so he encamped with his people. Moses was his prophet. Aaron was his spokesman. Okay, but God was king, and he brought that, that dysfunctional mass of former slaves, 12 tribes, together as one nation, and they entered their land. All right. Okay, I've got a few more minutes. Ready? To, you're, out, you're with me so far. Let's go on with the story. After Israel came into their land, they grew complacent, uh, and centuries passed. But now, for the first time, they had their own land, had their own farms. They were, they were, uh, they were industrialized in those days because that was the only industry they had. They began to prosper. They began to settle down. They began to, to become jealous of the nations that they saw around them. And they said, these other nations have human kings. Why do we have to be the oddball nation with the invisible king? <laughs> we want an embarrassment. You know, these high-level de delegations that come to our borders, the first thing they say to us is what? Take us to your king. <laughs> and we have to say, uh... Uh, well, he's around here somewhere. <laughs> okay, so they went to Samuel, who was their spiritual leader in those days, and they complained. They said, we want a human king so we can be like the other nations. We want to be normal. We want to be like the other nations. Samuel, and I'm paraphrasing here, Samuel argued with him. He said, that's not a good idea. Please change your mind. First thing that a human king will do is tax you. Believe me, the 10% flat tithe, it's a better system. Stick with God. I'm serious. You read 1 Samuel. Read 1 Samuel. That's what he said. And then the second thing that a human king will do, he'll take your sons, your daughters, for military service. You see those kings with their beautiful palaces and those fine-looking guards? Who do you think is going to pay for that palace? You're going to pay for that palace. And those fine-looking guards, who are they? Your kids. Your kids that the king took for himself. Stick with God. But they said, no, 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 Samuel. We're really unhappy about this. You know God. You talk to God for us. You tell him how unhappy we are. So unwillingly, Samuel prayed. And you have, an, you have a, uh, the record of this conversation in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. It says, but the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. So when we got into this land the first time, we rejected the kingdom of God. And what did we get in return? Human kings. We got human kings. Now there are six big books of the Bible, and you should read, as good students, you should read them all. Six big books in your Bible about the history of the kings. First and second Kings, first and second Samuel, first and second Chronicles. Read them all. But for this conference, for the Jerusalem encounter, because you've come from so many different nations and from so far away, I'm authorized to offer you a discount. <laughs> I can sum up those six books for you in one sentence. One sentence. How many want the discount? Okay, three of you. That's okay. Here it is. One sentence. The history of the kings in Israel. They were a disaster, <laughs> a total disaster, okay? Oh, they led the nation into civil war, okay? The northern kingdom after Solomon, the ten tribes split off here, not here, I'm thinking Mount Carmel, okay? The ten tribes split off in the north, the two here in the south remain. They never had good kings. The only, the only one human king that even comes close to being a great king was David. And the only reason that David qualifies as a good king is he was the only human king that all 12 tribes trusted enough to serve together under. After him, the nation is divided. Then it's political manipulation. It's corruption. It becomes assassination. They get so weak, they're overcome by their enemies, taken into captivity, and the 10 northern tribes disappear from history. Two here in the south, Judah and Benjamin, lasted a bit longer because they had reformers and they had the temple in this city. But eventually they too succumb and they fall prey to the Babylonians and God's kingdom doesn't exist on earth for 70 years. 
That's why they wept in Babylon. That's why when the, their captors said, oh, hey, now sing us the songs of Zion. Tell us about your God. Tell us about your kingdom. Tell us now, sing those songs again. It says, we wept by the rivers of Babylon. We hung up our harps. We couldn't sing those songs of Zion because they had been God's kingdom, the only nation on earth that had God as king, and it was gone. After 70 years, a handful come back here. Nehemiah, Ezra, it's not a triumphant return. Don't kid yourself. Read carefully. It's a remnant of a remnant, and they're never free again. They're under the Persians. Then they're under the Greeks. Then they're under the Romans. What had been God's kingdom on earth was an unimportant second, third, fourth-rate vassal state ruled by pagan foreigners. And God didn't speak to them. There was no prophetic utterance. There was no visitation. Hundreds of years, generations passed. The people who sat in darkness eventually began to see a great light. And what happened is a man arose in the Galilee with power from God. He could speak a word and the lame would get up and run. He could stretch out his hand and the eyesight would be given to people who had been born blind. He could walk on the surface of the water. He could multiply food for crowds of people. Word about him, this man went like electricity through the nation. God has heard our cry. God is returning to Israel. God has sent a great prophet. A great light has arisen in the Galilee. But wait, this man had more than miracles, right? It wasn't just miracles. It wasn't just crowds. He was preaching. He was proclaiming. This man came with a message to earth. What was he saying? Well, it was very clear what he was saying. He said it all the time. He started out his ministry with, repent, Israel. Listen, turn around. Change your ways. The kingdom of God is here. Okay? This is where we came into the movie. Okay? Of course they knew. Of course they knew. They knew they'd been the kingdom. They knew they'd lost the kingdom. They, they had been crying out, oh, God, forgive us when our fathers forced you to give us human kings. What a disaster. What a sin. Please return. Please restore. And then Jesus appears. And then Jesus appears. And he sends his disciples, go preach the gospel of the kingdom. He never called it the gospel of church growth. It includes church growth, but he never called it that. He never called it the gospel of salvation. He never called it the gospel of evangelization. He called it the gospel of the kingdom because it included all of the above. It's when God comes to town and rules, not just the church. The church is his instrument to bring the kingdom to earth. But the why, why have the church is for the nation. Okay, we are the instrument. We are the ones he said, pray in this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. We're the people who get it. We're the people who come under that rule. We're the ones who accept that command. And then we have the authority and the power of that command to bring the tribes together, to bring the tribes together, to look at our nation. I travel a lot. I've not been in one nation where the issue isn't ethnicity. Okay? Because the dream... The dream of having one, one race, one people, one belief, one nation, that dream is unattainable. And 100 years ago, there were two countries that tried to attain it, Germany and Japan. Okay, and we saw the results of that. But the other dream of, oh, everybody's the same, okay? Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, LGBT, gay, queer, trans, black, white, yellow, just mix them all together. Okay, that dream is also dysfunctional. And that's why this world cries out for the kingdom of God. If you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and put this before all else, all else, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else you need. You need church growth? You need to put more chairs in on Sunday? No problem, God says, no problem. But put my kingdom first. Put my, bring the tribes together. 
Look at your nation. Look at your nation. Can you be the ones? Can you be the ones who will bring the people together under one? This, this king. Is this king worth it? Is he worth it? Do we trust him enough to serve together under this one king? That's the hope of the kingdom. That's the hope of the nations. But that is God's plan. That's why we evangelize. That's why we plant. That's why we build congregations. That's why we reach out to the poor. That's why we train the children. The why is so that the kingdom of God will come and the nations will serve him once again. All right, I want to end with this. What if you had five minutes alone with the Lord and you could ask him only one question? Would you ask him, Lord, when will the NBA championship come back to the United States? <laughs> All right, as important as that is, you couldn't ask him if you had only one question. All right, you might ask him, Lord, when, when are you going to save my mother? That's more important. But you couldn't ask him that. Because afterwards, everybody you know is going to want to know, what did you ask him? And if you tell them, well, I asked him about my mother, they're going to be so angry, they're going to say, what about my mother? What about all of our mothers? Okay, you have to ask him a really good question. And the reason I asked you that is because the disciples asked Jesus one question before he was taken from them the last time. Here's their question. Some of you know this question. Some of you don't. Here's part of the answer. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's part of the answer to the question that they asked him. The last question his personal disciples asked. What was the question? Let's dial it back two verses. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Here's what it says. So when they had come together... They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? That's what they wanted to know. Will you now come back and rule our nation? Will you bring your righteous rule? Will you bring the tribes back together? Will you make us a nation that can be the head and not the tail? Will you reestablish that agreement between our ethnic groups so that we can honest to God, serve together, and build the kingdom together. Will you restore our nation? That's what they were asking. Are you now restoring the kingdom to Israel? Here's his answer, verse 7. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed to his own authority. In other words, he's saying, I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying when. Because if he told them, guys, it's going to take about 2,000 years, I think they would have been so depressed. So he said, I'm not going to tell you no, I'm not saying when, but this you must know, you will receive power, you're going to be my witnesses, witnesses of my kingdom, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to every nation throughout all the world, and then the end will come. And I've come to the end too. So would you pray with me? Lord, you brought us here to the city, the only city that the Bible says you chose as your own. You said of this city, there I put my name forever, forever. You brought your servants here. You brought your ministers here for a reason. I pray, Father, that your spirit will plant within them seeds of truth. I pray, Lord, that we will be empowered, that there will be a revelation given to us, that we will go back to our homes, to our churches, to our families, to our nations, to our tribes. And we will seek your kingdom first. We'll put your kingdom before all else and that you will give us everything else that we need so that our nation, our people can be the head and not the tail. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth. That means on our earth even as it is purposed in heaven. And we pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. God bless you.